I have a friend. This friend of mine has been smoking for 10 years. One pack of cigarette, maybe two packs at some time. Lately he is not smoking that much. Maybe six, six cigarettes a day or something like that. And he has done your test, complete true diagnostic test. And in the HRR gene, gene, gene locus CG0557921, he got 83%, which put him into a non-smoker. From 64% to 100%, it means he has no risk and he's interpreting this as a license to smoke. So is this a license to smoke? Unfortunately not. And in our current reporting, actually, we, we have a different cutoff um, for, for the smoking versus non-smoking. That AHRR loci is um, a very interesting location. Um, it is uh, related to a lot of different behaviors. But in the case of smoking in particular, smoking is one of those things that is actually an irreversible methylation change at that loci. Um, so generally, the more that you smoke, the more the methylation will decrease there. Generally, one of the things we know about smoking is that if you stop smoking, you actually will gain methylation back at that low side, but only to a certain sort of extent. And on average, actually, that is 83% uh, there at that AHRR low side. And so, um, so he's right around that cutoff where it might have been restored, but it is very, very unlikely to ever go back above that location due to that permanent effect that smoking would have. Um, and on our report, we look at just that one low side because it is by far the most described methylation change um, with behavior. However, there are, are now certainly many more and much more accurate um, ways to assess the total smoking behavior across a lifetime. Um, in fact, even the, the newest smoking predictors are actually better at quantifying risk of smoking outcomes than even self-reported smoking status, where you're giving sort of a pack per year basis. And so that low size is just one of the many low side they would change with smoking uh, that we can find from these epigenome-wide association studies. But uh, to not abstract it too much from, from the overall biological age, the changes with smoking are one thing, but the changes of how smoking influences biological age is another. And, and unfortunately, across the board, that is a very negative change. What, what, what could have happened? Why, why was he marked as a non-smoke? So as we're training these things originally, um, we are reliant on self-reported data. Um, and uh, so we're, we're sort of uh, relying on what people tell us, not to mention with our cohort specifically, we are also, um, I would say, general, dealing with very generally healthy individuals who really are doing mostly healthy behaviors. And so it's very likely that, uh, and again, as I mentioned, this has now changed in our reporting. Uh, but previously, we had probably a larger uh, range of uh, sort of non-smoking than smoking related signals, mainly because we were probably dealing with non-smokers or current non-smokers who might have smoked in the past, and they might have skewed that differential for us. Uh, but, uh, but as I said on the, the newest one, we actually have changed it even to some uh, ambiguatory uh, stages. So usually between 83 and 79, we have um, sort of unknown status. Um, uh, and then we've changed sort of above 83 um, and below 79 as being um, sort of a smoking signal. Let, let's talk about your company next. True Diagnostic. Um, as opposed to FAS Diagnostic, which is all the other companies on the market. How's the name? How did the name come? You know, we uh, we really started uh, in the market with biological age as our, our uh, sort of the main project we want to tackle. Um, and we were always thinking about how to educate people on chronological versus this concept of biological age. And, and so uh, like many in the space, um, uh, you know, we, we thought this true age would be um, the better way to say it. This is what you actually are, are aging. Um, and so we sort of took that true age concept and applied to, to the name true diagnostic. Okay. Uh, true age concept. Uh, tell me about that. So I know you have Danny Dampace and Omicam right now. Yeah. What's the true age concept? Generally, we started this company when DNA methylation sort of was 
really just starting. Uh, this was in in really the start of 2020. Um, at that point in time, um, you know, sort of seven years after Steve Horvath's first clock, um, which was a really one of the first multi-tissue biological age clocks to get widely used and, and widely validated. Um, and so this concept of, of really started with the goal of assessing the biggest risk factor in every chronic disease and death. Um, and uh, I think the biggest issue is we all know that chronological age is certainly a risk factor for every disease, but this biological aging process could even be better. Being able to molecularly categorize how your body is aging um, could then predict disease much better than just chronological age, which is a relatively arbitrary number for the number of trips you know, you've taken around the sun. Um, it's not really directly related to your own biology. And so this, I would say the search for biomarkers of aging has gone on a long time. Even in, initially, it was sort of how old you are plus one year for every pack per day you smoked going to our original conversation. And, and so um, so with that being said, the search has gone on for a long time. In 2013 with Steve Horvath, these methylation biomarkers were able to capture more risk than chronological age alone. If you were younger with this test than your chronological age, you were protected from negative outcomes in these big studies. Um, and vice versa, if you were older with this test, you were then more likely to develop these outcomes. And so it was really good at assessing that biggest risk factor. Um, and a lot of people got very excited about that. Um, we were uh, certainly a little bit slower to, to start this company in DOT, but we started this in 2020. Um, and uh, now we have the largest DNA method data set um, in the entire world. We've tested now over 75,000 patients um, since we started. Um, and we've used that to help create better and more informative clocks. So the three that are probably the most prevalent on our platform right now are going to be the omic age, as you mentioned, which is the most accurate um, predictor of lifespan. It's 92% accurate at predicting death within a five years period. The Dunedin pace, which is a, a pace of aging, it tells you how quickly you're aging right at this moment. It's the only third generation um, sort of biological age clock, and it's been validated in over 100 studies. Um, and then we have a newer clock that we're launching just in a week or two uh, that was developed with Yale, uh, Dr. Albert higgins Chance and Raghav Segal, um, uh, who are uh, now being able to tell you the age of every organ system in your body, or at least 11 organ systems in your body. Um, so those three clocks for us are all second generation clocks, all very uh, well published and, uh, and validated. And we will be using all, them on our platform to help people understand their biological aging. That's the symphony age. Correct. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. Let, let, let's get back to, to your company a bit. You are, correct me, you are the CEO of True Diagnostic and founder or mm -hmm. co-founder of True Diagnostics. What do you have an origin story, a founder story? Who are the founders? Certainly, yeah. So I've actually uh, taken a step more into the research realm. We've hired a recent CEO recently. Um, so now I'm sort of the head of research and development. But, um, but with that being said, yes, I am a founder um, and, uh, you know, took a, a winding path to, to get to where I'm at now. Um, my undergrad um, sort of experience was in biochemistry, had a lot of interest in peptide and protein chemistries. Um, so I uh, did a lot of research in, you know, recombinant and, and uh, solid phase peptide synthesis. Um, went to medical school after undergrad, um, went to the University of Kentucky, where I sort of went to my first two years, which is all of the clinical uh, schooling, I should say. But uh, then past my step one, um, got to my third year. Uh, where I got more involved with the patients on the clinical side of things and absolutely hated it. Uh, I didn't love what I was doing, uh, sort of formulaic of, of application to medicine, dealing with very sick patients. Uh, and so I decided to do something else. Um, so I, at that point, uh, I was lucky enough to to meet a business partner of mine, and we stumbled into, um, I would say, one of our, our, our first business, which was creating a compounding pharmacy um, that specialized in, in some of my, my area of interest, peptides and proteins, um, as a new class of drug molecules. Uh, that business was called TaylorMade Compounding, um, and it grew incredibly rapidly. We were the fourth fastest growing company in healthcare. Uh, we went from me as the first employee in 2016 to uh, about 200 plus employees uh, over in, in 2019. Um, so we grew really, really rapidly. And, and really, I, I was very lucky in this experience because I got to learn about this new space of medicine that I did not know existed, um, which was this sort of this integrative preventative area of medicine that was really only happening in, on a cash pay basis. Um, and in the US, I think it certainly had 
um, you know, sort of a renaissance. It is now a, a, a very big market um, of a lot of people interested in preventative health. Um, and I was able to be exposed to it. Uh, so we built a huge practitioner list. Um, and in this, uh, I should say, one of the things that we were always interested in is validating the effects of the products we were doing. Um, a lot of the things that we were doing were in phase two or phase one clinical trials, very early stages. Um, and we wanted to see how they were affecting outcomes. We knew that one of the weaknesses was this regulatory strategy and that the FDA at any point might say, you need to stop doing what you're doing. Um, and so we were always looking for ways to have, uh, I would say, a surrogate marker that could tell us about outcomes, right? We didn't have time for a 40-year placebo-controlled trial um, to assess the effects of some of these drugs. So we're always very interested in surrogates. And that's when I started to get very interested in these methylation clocks and surrogates because, um, you know, again, to, to hopefully study a, a lifespan intervention, something that could increase longevity, we don't want to wait half of our lifetimes. Uh, you know, we might wait half of our lifetimes for an answer that is no, it doesn't work. And then we're back to the drawing board. Um, and so these clocks are have been developed uh, theoretically as surrogates as well, where we might be able to see how they're affecting health span and lifespan um, on shorter intervals to see what ha is happening and changing those trajectories. Um, so I got really excited in this idea, uh, but I think moreover than that, I got just excited about methylation as a biomarker specifically. So um, in 2020, we decided to sell that pharmacy um, and then create True Diagnostic. We actually uh, sold it in January of 2020 and then bought our building for True Diagnostic in March of 2020, right at the start of the pandemic. So, so, so many ways I can go from there. Uh, let, let, let's go with this. Uh, imagine a product where you send in blood every month, just a finger prick, and they, they are sending you back uh, these supplements, what to take. So that's a pretty cool concept because there are certainly supplements that uh, you can measure and you can, you can pump up to be on the optimal level, right? Um, you don't even have to measure things. Those are hard to change with supplements, only the ones that you, you can easily control and relatively non-controversial. So this is the, this is the method of huh, one of the guy, Michael, do you know who I'm talking about? Michael Lusgarden? Yes. My, yeah. Michael Lusgarden. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's pretty cool. This is his method. And I just want to tell you how because it seems like you are on the on on the edge of some some huge revolutionary thing here because from a finger prick you can now admittedly it's not super accurate currently but you can actually guess and eventually hopefully guess much more accurately uh, all these biomarkers that uh, that you just have to take a lot of blood from to, to, to get that's, that's super exciting for me. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's one of the most exciting things is, you know, the scale of data, you know, molecular biology has always been a little bit less expensive than other parts of biology. For instance, you know, obviously now we can sequence a whole genome for, you know, $250 you know, a week. And that's a, a massive amount of information. Um, and, uh, you know, we can't quite do the same with some of the traditional measurements of these things that require uh, liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. Um, you know, they sort of are testing the, the mass of molecules to identify them. Um, what we've done with epigenetics uh, to some degree, and we were not the first to start this, um, Dr. Horvath and Dr. Ricardo Marioni have both uh, done similar things where they use the signals of gene expression to actually predict certain biomarkers within the body. Um, Dr. Horvath started with proteins. Uh, Dr. Marioni started again with proteins, um, but has, they have some really great use case examples. In, in the case of Dr. Marioni, you know, he's created a predictor of C-reactive protein. You know, that's obviously a protein and it's an inflammatory protein. It's measured on every single um, blood test that almost anyone would take it now. Um, and the DNA methylation prediction of that protein is actually better in almost every way than that of classical HSCRP. It's more predictive of disease, it's more precise, it's more associated with lifestyle outcomes and events. It's almost like a, a running Sorry, app. it is it is better than the blood test, the old school yeah. blood test? Uh, absolutely, it's it's better. And, and by, by saying that, it's 
the quite we need to go back to why we take these blood tests right um, what are we trying to find out and, and usually we're using them as markers of particular disease processes right um, it, it so it sort of tells us how likely are we to develop a certain outcome and uh, and the way that we validate that is is by looking at what we call hazard ratios meaning that if you have a control group and someone who has a marker at a certain level what is the increased risk of a negative outcome um, at versus the control and uh, and the level and uh, and so for that, what we see is that the CRP is more predictive of every outcome. In the case of, for instance, brain phenotypic information, um, like brain MRIs, um, it is actually uh, 6.4 times more predictive of brain MRI related outcomes than even regular CRP. It's more associated with obesity and, and drinking and smoking. Um, it's just a better marker. And we actually can predict it with DNA methylation, but we can do many things like this. That's just what I think one good use case example, because we know it's better in almost every way. But we can predict, um, you know, again, supplement levels like your omega-3 fatty acid levels, your ketone levels, your, um, you know, even spermidine and some of these other really unique and endogenous sort of products are now supplements. Um, and uh, so we can do a lot with just a single drop of blood. And I think, as you mentioned, there's a long way to go on this, right, in terms of accuracy and precision. But it's very clear that we can see signals of biological outcomes within the gene expression markers. Um, so, for instance, one of my favorite examples of this is... Uh, lung spirometry. Um, you know, this is something that most people don't always think of as a biomarker, but it's a very important biomarker. Things like the amount of air that you can express out of your lungs, we call that the forced expiratory volume or FEV1. Um, this is a, a really good biomarker uh, for, for things like COPD. Um, you know, COPD is the third most prevalent disease in America, um, and we have no diagnostic test for it. We have, you know, I, I should say no preventative or risk determinant diagnostic test. Uh, we can only diagnose it in a clinic once you've developed the disease. And that's unfortunate, right? We want to be able to detect things early and make changes early so that we can prevent disease. It's always very much easier to prevent than to treat. Um, and so one of the tests to confirm COPD is this FEV1. Uh, we can actually predict your forced expiratory volume of your lungs with a correlation of 0.99 to that of the traditional measurement. Um, and we don't need you to come into the office. We don't need you to perform a test with your lungs. We just need a drop of blood. And from that same drop of blood, we can also tell you about your risk of, you know, 10 other diseases. We can tell you about your molecular biomarkers. We can tell you about your aging. We can tell you about your immune cell subsets, all with just one drop of blood in the DNA that comes from that. Um, and the reason for that is that we have so much information within the DNA of your blood. Um, all of these gene expression profiles are now, for the first time, due to artificial intelligence breakthroughs, able to be interpreted. And we need much more data to train these algorithms in much more precise and accurate ways. Um, and then we need to validate them to show that they actually work the way that we say they do. Um, some things that, you know, the other companies who have made similar claims like Theranos um, have never really done. Um, and so uh, it needs to be very science-based. We need to, to publish all of the results so that people can see that they actually work and the methods to do that um, and then replicate them independently. But that is something we're working on. And I think for the same reason I think that you're excited, you can get a lot of information from uh, a, a drop of blood that's easy to collect, that can be done in rural areas. It doesn't have to be refrigerated, shipped. Um, and uh, then you can make personalized, actionable decisions for a lot of different things. Correct. That's mm -hmm. correct. Back to back back to your company. Can you can you tell me how many? What's your valuation and how many employees you have? Yeah. So we, I would say, don't have a valuation. Uh, not that I, I think I'm trying to hide it, but we um, uh, have never raised any capital. Um, it's all been private funding. Um, so we've never really had to go through that step. But uh, we have no private capital. Raise. No, nothing. No private capital as of yet. Um, and um, so we have now uh, we just did a, a little bit of a, a merger slash acquisition, um, which took us from about 35 employees to about uh, 75 employees. Um, and so uh, we are uh, still relatively small, but um, I would say uh, growing rapidly as this diagnostic area is growing. All right, and, uh, and 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 my next question will be: Who are the shareholders? But uh, but but there is a conspiracy theory here, <laughs> and that will be a good segment going into the rejuvenation Olympics, yeah. which is, you know, I've heard from multiple places, and and they are disconnected from each other, but I'm also pressing it, and and turns out they are just speculating, but but. 
multiple people speculating the same thing based on, well, based on speculation. So <laughs> the idea is that the Rejuvenation Olympics have not been updated for a very long time because Brian Johnson is invested in true diagnostic. Therefore, he doesn't want an update to happen until he's he he gets low enough to <laughs> be on a good place. Yeah, no, I, I can understand why people would think that. Um, you know, uh, I I, I want to mention just maybe the history of Rejuvenation Olympics to start, which is that um, that it was entirely Brian's idea. Yeah, uh, thinks uh, certainly that, that he I would say he considers himself a rejuvenation athlete, someone who is focused completely and fully on living for as long as he can and taking the proper care of his body. And I think that he wants to start a movement around that as well, where people are doing the same. Um, so together we started this uh, Rejuvenation Olympics. Uh, uh, sort of website and idea, um, and uh, and we in order to do that, we we basically set one parameter. What is the the parameter that we're going to use for this leaderboard? Um, and that is what we set as the Dunedin pace, um, just because of its validation. Um, we know that it responds to intervention like caloric restriction, so it satisfies a lot of the scientific boxes that we would want for an age biomarker. Um, and uh, but but we wanted to do this in collaboration with Brian, so we created it as a separate website. Um, uh, in terms of the Rejuvenation Olympics. Um, and so uh, originally we, we were starting to update that. Uh, you know, we try to do it sort of every month. Um, but as you know, uh, recently we have not done it, probably in the last six months. Uh, and the reason for that is not any financial relationship with Brian and True Diagnostic. We've actually have no financial relationship, not even affiliate commissions or anything of that nature. It's, it's mainly because... Uh, at True Diagnostic, we, we're now getting so much data um, that having it stored in two separate locations uh, is very, very difficult uh, for the manual processing and validation. Um, and not to mention, we have two places to keep consents, um, which is uh, particularly troublesome um, about updating results if we don't get updated consents from individuals. And so what we've really tried to do over these last few months is to to now actually take full control of that website um, where we can actually link it to our backend platform. Um, so the only reason that results have not been updated is, is really our fault, the true diagnostic, um, despite I think actually Brian's insistence uh, on that. Um, you know, he, he certainly wants that to be uh, upgraded. He, uh, I, I think, is, is very interested in this idea and, and wants to get public um, sort of use and mass adoption. We've been letting him down a little bit, quite frankly. Um, uh, and so that's certainly our fault. But I will also mention, you know, Brian started the, the leaderboard at number one, um, the biggest age reversal. He went from a, a point, uh, 1.01 rate of aging. So he was actually faster um, in aging uh, than, you know, his, bi his actual chronological age. Um, and then he reversed that to, I think, a 0.69 um, biological aging, which is a incredible reduction and, and uh he was number one on that leaderboard oh, oh actually before even this led these last few updates he was number seven so he's been bumped down a few spots certainly um and uh and i think in the newest one he might even be bumped down more just because we're getting so many people now who are opting in uh, but, uh, but i think that he would actually like that i think he actually would accept that he i think he wants to encourage people to beat him to see what's working to see what the those things are so so uh unfortunately no financial relationship no conspiracy just uh difficult logistics in a very busy time. Thank, thank you for cleaning that up. Mm -hmm. He's he's also in a in a hard place there because regarding the relative leaderboard, mm -hmm. people can 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 get in a really bad place to <laughs> gain a lot and and, and and well that's how you win that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and regarding the absolute leaderboard, he's relatively young, right? Mm -hmm. 45 years old. The older you are, the larger uh, progress you can make in there. Let me let me bring up a couple of problems with the uh, with the need and pace, and rejuvenation Olympics, of course. Well, my my, my very first problem. So the need and pace is not a biological age measurement. So it's not like you're 35 years old and uh, you you come down like your omicam age to 29. No, Dunedin pace is the pace of aging measurement, and that brings up a couple of mathematical problems. The first that came to my mind is that the unofficial winners of the Rejuvenation Olympics are people in cryo chambers, right? They have 
slowed their pace of aging <laughs> a lot. The, the, the problem is that it doesn't go negative, right? You don't, like, you go only one way with Dunedin pace, but you actually want to go backwards. And I can address those uh, if you'd like. Uh, oh, just, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, let's do that because I have some yeah. more. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So, um, so first of which, I think that that's exactly what we, what we want the leaderboard to do is to to tell us about who is slowing their aging the most. Um, and and I think that goes along with the second topic, which is the pace versus the overall age. And 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 I I think that for us, um, you know, one of the concepts around any biological marker of aging is um, effectively can we actually reverse this process? Um, and, and that's a hard one to answer. Um, do, we, do we see reductions in biological age clocks in certain interventions? Absolutely. But I think that, uh, you know, with these being so new, we still have to ask the question of, are these, do, do biological age reductions in these clocks increase lifespan by the same amount? Um, and, and so, for instance, I'll give you an example, uh, you know, uh, glycan age is a, is a great biomarker that's based on glycans, um, but you can change it pretty, pretty easily and with pretty large deltas with just estrogen. Estrogen can cause up to a 20 year age uh, reduction in glycan age just with intervention. But we know that glycan age, uh, or I should say that estrogen therapy um, doesn't actually increase lifespan by 20 years, right? And and so uh, we we want these to be predictive measures of outcomes. And, and in order to do that, we also have to show that the interventions that are registering is changed within the measurements are also changing the outcomes. And whenever they're too modifiable, that actually makes us worried um, because so far no one has beat aging, right? Uh, we've all we're all succumbed to aging at this point. Um, some people have done better than others in terms of you know centenarians who can live over a hundred versus people who might die prematurely. But at the time, no one has beaten aging, and so for us to see massive age reductions, um, I think is first off uh, an expectation that I think is a little bit unreasonable at this point in time. Um, you know, if we can see age reductions of one or two years, that's significant, right? Because that could mean that we're increasing lifespan by that same amount, um, and that's not trivial. Um, you know, the the maximum lifespan has seen very, or the average lifespan has been very little increase over the past couple decades. Um, and, and so, so I think we need to set reasonable expectations about the amount of reversal, um, as well. We don't want these things to have major changes unless they're also having major changes in outcomes. Um, otherwise they're not effective surrogates. And so, uh, so we want to be careful about the age reversal topic. We, that's obviously what we're gearing for, but we have to figure out how to effectively prove it first. And then, you know, in, generally in terms of the pace of aging, it might not have a negative pace of aging, but it has a negative compared to chronologic. So as long as you're below one, that again, is going to be then slowing that rate. Um, and, and one of the reasons we chose that Dunedin pace over the age biomarkers is because, um, as I mentioned, it's responsive to change in for things that we know already improve lifespan and health span. So uh, in particular, it's the only clock that has been shown to be significantly reversed with caloric restriction. Um, the calorie study uh, done by Columbia uh, sort of showed this, that all the previous biological clocks didn't see significant reductions with caloric restriction, but we know caloric restriction is the most validated therapy for age reversal or lifespan extension in almost every animal species. Um, and so this is sort of our, our check-in. Does it work with the thing that we know really works well in the most validated study? Um, and the Dunedin Pace was the only one to do that. Um, in fact, those first generation clocks trained to predict chronological age, they actually went up with caloric restriction. They went in the wrong direction. And so that's why we at True Diagnostic will never use those first generation clocks. But it's also why we selected do need and pace. We wanted it to be a true measure of what people were doing that actually responds to interventions we know extends lifespan. So that's sort of why we chose it. And I think uh, hopefully speaking to those two uh, deficiencies, um, which uh, I think might not be as big of deficiencies as we think. How, how does Dunedin pace changes over a lifetime? Yeah, so across age, we see a trend that increases. Um, I liken it a bit to compound interest, um, you know, except the opposite, right? Uh, the, the, the slower that you're aging, the, the longer you can keep it slow. But if you start to accelerate aging at any point in your life, 
you're more likely to age faster. And so it's, uh, you start sort of rolling down that hill a little bit quicker and exponentially increasing that age. Um, and this can start very, very, very early. There's data that shows that even in children with low socioeconomic status or adverse childhood experience, um, that they have increased rates of aging that then even predict their, their aging rates at age 35 or 45. Um, and, and so, uh, so we know that uh, this is a process that is, you know, important from the moment that we're born um, uh, and then will tend to increase over time. That's why also on the rejuvenation leader, leaderboard, we, we take into account the, the, the trends with age so that we can make sure that it's not only 18 year olds that are on that leaderboard, but consistent among different age groups. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. So you're, you're normalizing it uh, to, so, so there is the relative and on the absolute, you are normalizing the, how, how do you normalize it to, to ages? Can, can you tell us the, the yeah. algorithm here, what's, what's the <laughs> mathematics? Definitely. And, and, and so uh, I, would, I would have to say though, uh, it is not the most complicated correction method. Sort of what we do is we just basically determine the average slope trend, right? So we know that this increases with age. We are able, you know, and going back to your sort of middle school mathematics, we do this equation y equals mx plus b, um, right? Where we set the, the slope of that line. And we use the average slope increase as a way to control for expectations of where you would be with age. And we use that as a correction factor um, to your overall rate of aging. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I, I We'll say that there's one big weakness with that. Um, and the weakness then goes to extrapolating um, to say that I'm aging at a rate of an 18-year-old or I'm aging at a rate of a 15-year-old. And the reason for that is because even though it has a slow linear trend up with age, it's not incredibly linear, definitely not as linear as those biological clocks, right, which shoot up directly with age. As a trend, this is a lot more sort of a very, very slow, gradual incline. And so um, even though we use it as a correction method, it's not probably not sufficient to say, I've got the aging rate of a 12 year old or a 13 year old, um, because uh, you, you, that that's a sort of a, a strange e extrapolation. Um, so we use it to normalize. But but I think that if you're trying to extrapolate to what age you are based on your rate of aging, it's not the best method to do that. So with Dunedin pace, isn't that the, the children are aging much faster than, let's say, 30 years old, and then very old people are aging much faster again? Is, is that? Correct. The, the pace of aging goes up significantly as we age um, and, and starts relatively low. So the average rate of aging in younger individuals is more like 0.75 than it would be in your, your 80s, which might be more like 0.98 to point you know, 1.05 or something. Um, so it tends to go up with age. So, so then you have the omic M age and the symphony age that's coming up. Uh, is there any relevance of these ages to the future of rejuvenation Olympics in your visions? Yeah, definitely. You know, biological aging um, is a complicated topic. Um, it, it really is. You know, when we first started our company in 2020, we had the nine hallmarks of aging. Um, so everyone sort of saw these as, you know, definitive changes would happen with age. Now, um, conceptually, people have published even 15 or 16 hallmarks of aging. And that's because as we get older, we see dysfunction in a lot of different ways. We can see it in our mitochondria. We can see it with telomere length shortening. We can see it with, um, you know, a, a proteomic degradation. And, um, and, and there, there are so many things that the change with aging. And one of the problems with aging is we don't know what's causal versus correlative. So we're not sure what happens first, right? It might be that, again, it's almost certainly not true scientifically, but I'll use it as a hypothetical case. We, you know, it's almost like telomere shortening could then cause proteomic dysfunction. So we don't know what's cause or effect. So what we're really trying to do is to characterize changes with happen with age so we can basically use those as risk factors to inform us of what might happen. And, and so when we're doing this, uh, originally, again, this was done with like nine blood-based biomarkers in the case of phenoage. Um, and then it was sort of progressed to more large-scale molecular markers. And so now people are doing biological age clocks for proteomics, metabolomics, DNA methylation, these big large-scale markers. But the problem is it's very, very complex. And so, um, you know, we take incremental um, steps in getting better and better biomarkers. Um, 
And we know that they are incrementally better because they're more predictive of outcomes, right? That's what we want at the end of the day, a very, very predictive biomarker. And so um, these biomarkers continue to get better. In the case of omic age and symphony age, the way that they've gotten better is certainly increased hazard ratios. Um, so we can see that they predict disease outcomes better than other clocks. Uh, in the case of omic age, better than any other clock um, in, in the cohort that we measured it in. Um, and, and then uh, the other thing that's very unique about these two is that they're able to tell you why you're aging. And this has been a big weakness as well with the biological clocks, because you could take our tests, for instance, and you could see that you were 10 years younger or 10 years older. But the problem is we would tell you the same interventions regardless. If you were 10 years older or 10 years younger, we tell you what we know about improving aging, which is very little outside of the traditional things you probably already know. Um, and so the question is, if, you, if you're not going to get personalized recommendations based on how you're aging, why take the test in the first place? Um, because does it help you to actually know? A lot of people have the same critique of genetic testing, where you can take a test for your genetics, but there's very little you can do to change it outside of gene therapy, um, which is you know very rare. And so, uh, so the question is, why test? And so with symphony age and with omic age, we now have ways to tell you about your heterogeneous aging, right? We might not all age in the same way. So for instance, your friend who is a smoker, he might um, you know, have increased lung aging, which then increases inflammation throughout the body, which might hurt cardiovascular or metabolic aging, um, you know, versus someone else who, let's just say, um, you know, has a terrible diet, right? Um, you know, just only eats no vegetables, eats only, you know, high saturated processed fat foods, all of a sudden, he's going to have worse cholesterol, worse metabolic health. He might have, again, inflammation, but in a different way, not coming from his lungs, but coming from sort of these diet-related things. And so you, those, both of those people might have increased aging, um, but in very different ways. And, and the treatments to slow that, um, we might want to give different recommendations, right? For someone, for, for the first person, it might be stop smoking. For the other one, it might be improved diet. But with the previous test, you couldn't make any of those recommendations. Now with the newer clocks, what we can do is we can actually tell you, for instance, with Symphony Age, which is the one that will go on rejuvenation on Olympics leaderboard, we can actually tell you what organ system is aging the fastest versus the slowest. Um, so we can say for you, you might have aging, um, you know, two years older in you know, your lungs. And, and we might say, here's the things we can do or we know to reverse aging within the lungs. Um, so now we can make personalized recommendations. So I think these clocks have made a step forward because they're more predictive, but they're also now explanatory. Um, and that's super helpful. Um, and so now we can make some recommendations. So on the Rejuvenation Olympics, we're actually going to add a top five leaderboard for all 11 organ systems. And so we hope to figure out what people are doing to really improve those organ systems um, aging and then uh, make hopefully recommendations that people can share based on their own success. So we have your chronological age, which is the answer to the question, how old are you? And we have the omicam age, which is your biological age, which is the answer to the question of how old are you if you would have been frozen in a cryo <laughs> chamber for a 300 years. So you might say I'm 30 years old, even though you're 330 years <laughs> old. So that's your biological age. And then there is the concept of how fast you are aging, your pace of aging, and that the need and pace. And then final concept is from your Symphony A test that's going to happen in the future. And that is on ages on different organ systems. Let me let me let me give you an interesting idea that I had. Uh, I was thinking about just just from a conceptual point of view, what would the need and pace of aging be um, be pretty useful for people? And you know, from a system design point of view, the the feedback is pretty slow. So so, so I, I buy your product. Uh, okay, so it is it is super fast compared to compared to many things. But I buy your product, uh, it comes in a few days. If I'm in the US, I'm not in the US, so it's going to be a few weeks. And then I prick it and a few weeks. And so, 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 so this is pretty, pretty slow. What would be cool if you could just put like a continuous aging, pace of aging monitor on yourself. And, and when you eat a donut, then Oh, my pace of aging go up. <laughs> now that would be a 
pretty good instant feedback. How feasible is it to put a small device on you and keep monitoring your your pace of aging? Yeah, so I think that you have a, a couple ways to answer that question. I think one is in the technical feasibility. You know, could we actually mm -hmm. do um, uh, you know a diagnostic like that that uh, they could measure uh, uh, enough uh, resolution. And right now, unfortunately, the way that we do this molecular biology for DNA methylation, we're not able to do sort of point of care systems, right? So uh, that would be a great thing if we might be able to even have something in the physician's office, right? That you could go in, you know, take a blood draw, put your blood draw in and get a result very quickly. Um, at the moment, that doesn't exist. Um, in the future, it certainly might, but the technology doesn't exist. And so you can't do methylation, uh, but you might be able to do other biomarkers, right? like metabolomic biomarkers, like we already know that glucose obviously is a metabolite um, and uh, there are continuous glucose monitors that work. Uh, one of my my sort of passion projects is actually biomarker tattoos, um, where you could actually look at how a biomarker is changing based on the color change of a tattoo on your body, um, uh, which I think is really interesting. But the problem with those is that usually they're based on one metabolite, right, or one measurement. Um, so like glucose or albumin or something of that nature. And along with that, um, generally one biomarker is not sufficient to effectively predict outcomes or, or to predict their pace of aging. So I think that, that that is the technical problem. With that being said, you're going to start to see a lot of this. Um, so for instance, we we helped a, a big toilet manufacturer brand um, with some of our data create a metabolomic measurement of biological age in the urine so that every time you use the restroom, you can get... Yeah, that's pretty cool. I had yeah. that idea as well. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, Exactly. And I and... want my toilet to analyze my <laughs> stool. <laughs> Exactly. And so, yeah, and they're, you know, they're, so they're looking for metabolites in the urine that they can sort of, you know, predict biological aging with. And, uh, and so, so it's certainly happening. But the problem, I think, is, is that usually they can't get enough data to create highly predictive models. And without highly predictive models, you might be getting the wrong information sometimes. Um, and that's a big problem, because that's really what we don't want. We don't want you to, to get information, uh, you know, do as best you can to change that whenever it's the wrong information. It's not directly correlated to that outcome. And, and therein lies the problem with age generally is that, uh, again, it's so complex and there's not, you know, very much agreement on the definition. You know, there's no objective, I would say, marker. The reason that people use time until death is because they think that's probably the most objective marker is how long are you living? And that's one of the other problems is that it's very unlikely that anything that you do within a probably a, a 24 hour time period is going to have a major impact on your lifespan. And so, uh, so again, this is where that pace of aging can sometimes be almost too responsive, right? Because let's just say that, you know, we um, do everything we can for positive health within a 24 hours period. That's still a very, very small fraction of our overall life. And, and so it, what that needs to do is it needs to have such precision in the directionality that that precision is very, very hard. Think of this as, um, you know, there, there's probably a lot of other, you know, uh, different criteria. Let's just say that, uh, you know, you go to a lake to test water quality one time in the, you know, in your entire lifespan, um, is that day, that single day going to be consistent with your overall trajectory? And, and so for instance, you might've had rain the day before or the day of, um, and you pick up more mud, you know, or, or debris because things are flowing off the land into the water. One single time point is very difficult to be able to predict trajectory and outcomes, especially when the time period that you want to measure it is such a long period. So I think that there's a technical problem with that, but there's also a conceptual problem, which is that <clears throat> if we really wanted to give us good information, it has to be so sensitive that it works in one single time point on one single test throughout all of the dynamic changes that happen with our body across age and time and, and you know, all these different things. Um, and so I think it's really, really difficult. I would love for that to be the case. But again, I think our understanding of aging isn't resolute enough to get that level of precision. And, and at the end of the day, I think, uh, that, you know, we would love to make those claims, but we also want it to be real, you know, science. It's easily defendable. And, and I 
think that that's really hard. Um, and so, so I would love that at one point in time. Um, I think that we certainly will get there. Um, the way that we get there, though, is through multiomics, um, this idea of really large scale data and uh, using the new technology of the age, these the machine learning models, these neural nets, these transformer models to be able to create really predictive signals. Um, and so I think that it's certainly not out of reach, but we're not there yet. Yeah, you know, it's it's, uh, it's important to talk about the the limitations of the metrics, even in the in only for the game of longevity, because the, the the main problem with games is this concept of value capture. It's like the monster era of bodybuilding is the concept of value capture, where the value is the size of the muscle. That's the that's the classical example but uh, even in uh, in here we could have a concept of th th there will be many kinds of value captures with pace of aging and one uh, one obvious way would be that hey if i really want to win this thing then i'm going to freeze myself and that's how you know like now that's a value capture here and and obviously that cannot be the goal <laughs> yeah but uh, well, yeah, you know, uh, well, I, I think, and again, I, I think you bring up a good point, though. Uh, I mean, there's so many points of value capture, but I also think that, you know, with what you're talking about with cryopreservation um, specifically, I think we should talk about this thing called the longevity escape velocity um, uh, that you're probably very familiar with, but it's this idea that we will start to have technological improvements that are that are so helpful in terms of increasing lifespan that will actually age slower than the amount of technological improvement that we have to escape lifespan. And so, um, so you know, cryopreservation is one of those things. If you can get even extension of 10 to 20 years in your life, the amount of technological innovation to help us live longer in that period of time could be pretty incredible. So I, I think that, uh, you know, slowing your rates of aging or stopping it entirely with something like cryopreservation, I think are, are certainly exciting reasons because the science is growing so quickly in the area of longevity. In fact, my working theory is that it might be the rejuvenation Olympics that unintuitively brings us to longevity escape velocity. And there are many ways to, to make an argument here, but uh, what I like to do is from the our philosophy of games, which is that Life could be conceptualized as, as, as a bunch of games happening simultaneously. And you are, you, you, every time you play a game, you take on an agency, you become a completely different person. We are right now the people of having a discussion. That's, that's who we are. But uh, if you go home and talk to your family, or if you have, the, then, then you become the father or the, the sun that you become a different person you switch agencies that's the fluidity of agency but you know what's really interesting here is that playing sports th these agencies are so powerful as a motivation that these are above the law bodybuilders not using steroids like steroids are illegal everywhere but they are unofficially allowed to do that right like Games are above the law. I can punch you in the face only if we are playing a, <laughs> a kickbox game or some kind of uh, martial arts. But otherwise, it's like, what the heck is completely illegal for me to, 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 to hurt you in that way, to violate your, your, your property as, as, as your body. Like, so games transcend law. They transcend ethics, uh, interestingly. And, you know, if we have such a motivational power, like a game of rejuvenation, a game of longevity that is transcending laws and ethics, then interesting things will come out of that. Yeah, yeah. It does allow you to push those boundaries, I, I guess. Uh, you know, I've never really thought of it that way, to be honest with you. Um, but, but I do like that. I, you know, I, I think about... Um, 
Yeah, I, I think it comes from um, pushing those boundaries. It's it's trying to trying to win. Um, I think, and and what that does is encourage effort, and and effort uh, encourages, I think, lesson learning. Um, and and so as we learn more lessons, I think that we uh, sort of dial ourselves back in um, on where is the most effective way to spend our time and effort. And and, and so I, I certainly like that philosophy. I've never, I think, really thought about it as deeply as that. But I I think that that's also fundamentally what we're trying to do is. is is to encourage people to try and then to share the feedback with the world so that collectively we can all learn the same lessons together. What what is your vision? There, there's a lot of ways to answer that. I think I have you know I certainly have visions for you know I think aging. Um, I certainly have visions for um, you know DNA methylation as a biomarker. Um, I uh, and I think that those are wildly different actually. Um, and and so whenever I think about specifically my vision for age, you know. I, I, I do think that uh, right now we're limited in our ability to investigate aging, um, and it comes from this lack of clear defined endpoint or outcome, um, and also the lack of any surrogate uh, way to measure that outcome, and then lastly, any regulatory pathway to to sort of effectively test that outcome. Um, so right now in the, in the U.S., we cannot you know do a trial for aging because as a as an endpoint outcome. They're very. It's never been approved before. Um, it just recently got approved in 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 dogs um, by the company Loyal, um, which is doing some amazing work in drug development for canine life extension. Um, that is uh, um, a big step in the right direction because we have a, a sort of a, you know going back to this game structure. Um, even the FDA rules and regulations are effectively a game structure <laughs> where people try and out compete. And so I think that right now we don't have a game. For longevity, um, in it, it recognized within the government, um, and I think that that's a big problem. Um, but I also think that these aging biomarkers need to mature even further. They need to be effectively trusted by researchers, and the con the concept of age needs to also change for most physicians. You know, most physicians and people think of aging as a vanity thing, right? All the the different changes that might happen in our skin or our appearance uh, as we age, but it's what we're trying to do is to tell how this is actually a health marker that predicts outcomes. Um, and so I think conceptually we need that to change. So hopefully the aging biomarkers, the conception, the regulatory pathway will all change. And then we can actually start to do work of uh, assessing what works and what doesn't. Have a true north to really commit to the game, I guess, in the investigation. So that's my vision, I think, for hopefully aging and uh, and how we go about solving it. Um, I think that already there were some very, very exciting things, such as, you know, whole organ body transplants, right? Um, I think that partial reprogramming, these are the things that um, get me excited about maybe possibly increasing and, and hitting that longevity escape velocity. What can we expect from the Rejuvenation Olympics in the future? <laughs> Well, first and foremost, an update. Finally, I, I think uh, we'll, we'll get an update here very soon. So we hope to have this uh, updated uh, by the end of the month. Um, by the end of next month, which would be June, we will have a completely redone website with new interfaces, with new ways to consent, um, and also hopefully the ability to uh, compare different aspects of aging versus the entire data set um, so that we can actually uh, go in and do your own analytics, see what the averages are, you know, what that equation of, for instance, is of, of the regression line with age. So we, we want this to be interactive so you can actually, you know, go in there and ask questions and hopefully get answers. Um, and along with that, we hope to have. What, what do you mean? Yeah. So uh, we want uh, to you to be able to see some of the data that we have on this. Um, for instance, like looking at where are the people who have the best ages live. You know, what areas of the country do they live? You know, uh, not not individuals, but aggregates. That way it's not personalized confidential information, but um, but aggregates to look at trends and patterns. So we can say, you know, um, out of the top 100 people, are they mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. supplement more uh, um, that is uh, more frequently used than the bottom 100 people or, or something of that nature? So we want the ability to sort of use these big meta analysis from big data sets to even interact and, and maybe find some lessons um, and then suggest maybe lessons to be learned. So these will all happen in successive ways. This interactive database probably will not happen anytime soon. Um, probably, I would say, four to six months. But at the very least, we'll start with updates on the current leaderboard. In a, in a month or two, we will add um, some, some I would say, some new features. Uh, it will look uh, and be streamlined. And then we will start to add the Symphony Age, Oregon System Aging Leaderboard. 
dashboards. Those are the immediate focuses. But um, in the future, I think we want to make this a community um, more than anything that people are able to interact with, that um, that people are able to find lessons and ask questions. You know, famous board game developer said the heart of every game when he's designing, the heart of every game is the point system. And right now, that's what you have. I was... You know, something is missing and I was trying to figure out what is that that's missing from this because that's what you have. You have the leaderboard, the point system of the game. And I have an intuition and I am wondering what you're thinking about that. I, I think what's missing is the goat. Okay. A while ago, I watched a TED talk about from BuzzFeed employees that they're they they took a goat into the into into their CEO's office and then they live streamed it and 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 as people were waiting for the CEO to come into to his office, more and more people come on that live stream. And the talk was about to analyze that moment that hey, why did that go viral? And they come to the conclusion that it is because of the shared expectations of something is going to happen. So people come together and they were talking and they, they were like a temporary community expecting something to happen. And that is what's happening in like a football game that people come together, they are, they are watching it and they are expecting who's going to win. I don't know how to add this element, the GOAT, to the to the co to the rejuvenation olympics but i think something that is the, the anticipation and something to happen that's missing here do you have any thoughts on that oh that's a great idea i like the i like the uh, you know abstract way that, that you think about this concept it, it certainly gives me ideas on how to improve it um you know i think that um I, yeah, I, I, it's a hard question, um, uh, and one I, I you know I, I like to put more thought into. I think immediately what what comes to mind is more immediate reaction and gratification, um, which I think goes back to your initial conversation of could we have you know a, a shorter time period right to to analyze and see results. You know, I think that yeah, you know, it's it, it's certainly hard. I think the expectation though, I think, is we all age, right? I think that that's the you know uh, um, I often liken this to. Uh, you know, if you try and write a script for Superman, it's sometimes very difficult because he's so powerful. You need an effective enemy. And, and here, I think we have such an effective enemy, it's hard to mount any reasonable um, response in aging. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, the, the, the way that they sort of write for Superman is, is fighting against time. And I think that's the exact same thing that we're doing. We, we, the limited concept we have universally is this time feature. And so uh, I think the, the more immediate results that we can get, they can translate this into lifespan extension, quality lives with fans, friends, family members, pets and animals. Um, I think that that will be the way that we drive, you know, uh, more of that uh, expectation um, where people are exceeding expectation and then therefore drawing our attention, um, just like that goat, uh, right, I, I think. Um, so I think we need more immediate feedback to draw attention to abnormal results, which in this case would be lifespan extension. You see, in some sense, this is the most significant game that humanity have ever played. Who do you know, like personally, on the Rejuvenation Olympics? Yeah, so right, right, from the current leaderboard. <laughs> you know, I actually know a lot of them um, from the current leaderboard. Love them. Um, yeah, you know, uh, there, I mean, there there are quite a few. You know, I think that um, in the top ten leaderboard now, we obviously have Brian Johnson. Um, you know, um, uh, there is uh, Jin Bell, who's number four on the leaderboard. Um, you know, who's very uh, uh, involved now in in these spaces. We have um, some of one of our physicians and in, in Dr. Diane Ginsburg. Um, uh, who's on the leaderboard. We have uh, Tiat Lim, who is uh, really advocating um, in parts of Southeast Asia for age rejuvenation. And then we also have Michael Luskarten, who we talked about before, who is uh, sort of one of those expert data-driven biohackers. Um, and then also, uh, you know, even uh, uh, now, we actually even have Brian's father, uh, Richard Johnson, which is certainly very interesting uh, because, you know, they've done some of the plasma exchange and transfers. So those are some of the people I think that I, you know, I've talked to, um, you know, in, in this exploration and probably many, many others, you know, we still have most of the participants who are on the leaderboard coming from our 
integrative medicine community. So people who are managed by physicians trying to do that preventative health. And so usually I know their physicians very well, and we're always trying to, to find that result. So we've got even, uh, you know, at one point, Steve Aoki and Peter Diamandis, uh, you know, were on both of those leaderboards. Um, and uh, I think that- uh, for Peter what... Diamandis is still there. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And for what it's worth, I think they will probably have some more celebrities uh, that will be on there here relatively soon. Uh, and, and so I think that hopefully they'll, again, uh, get the space excited um, about what we can do. What's the difference between unknown and private participants? Yeah, so there, there's really uh, not a lot of difference. We just don't have the consents to use their names or use their identifying information, um, but they do have given us permission to put up their score. And, and so uh, people who don't consent will not be on the leaderboard whatsoever, but anonymous and, and private participants have given us permission to list their score, but not their name. But but what's the difference? Sometimes it's called private, sometimes unknown. It's just a bug. Yeah, well, it, 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 fortunately, it's not a similar nomenclature, correct? Um, no, okay. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so uh, we'll again, cer certainly change that. Um, again, the biggest issue has been this consent system, uh, making sure that it, it we're not putting up results uh, for people who don't want their results and making sure that we are putting up results for people who do. That consent system has been our number one priority and the reason why it hasn't had an update in, in a little bit of time. Well, I believe we arrived to my favorite section of these interviews, which is the fear the contrarian question. So the contrarian question is, what is it that you strongly believe to be the case but most people disagree with you on that. Oh, this is tough. I like to think that a lot of my views are, are driven by science. Um, and usually science has consensus uh, because it's fact driven. Um, and, and so I would say that there's probably not a lot of contrarian opinions I hold um, necessarily in the, in, in the, the field of aging. I think that, um, you know, the, even in aging, I think the the most controversial topics with lack of consensus go to things like um, is aging a disease, and uh, and you know I think that right now the consensus is probably no. The FDA does not have it as a disease. The World Health Organization does now have an ICD uh, sort of extension code that lists aging as the cause of many disease, which is great. I think it's progress. But I think that you know many researchers here in the United States do not think aging is a disease. And I, I think that that is uh, something I would disagree with. I do think aging is a disease. Um, I do think it is modifiable and, and, and mitigatable, uh, maybe not in major ways at the moment, but certainly um, um, in ways that would affect quality of life and total number of years lived. Because I'm an evil capitalist, I always ask my guests this question, how can people give money to you? Yeah. Ooh. So, um, you know, again, we, we've been a private funded. And so the best way I think to, to sort of help our vision or our, our cause is to participate, um, you know, to uh, get your own aging test done. Um, and also, you know, uh, uh, maybe get involved in research studies that we're doing. So whenever, if you do a test, uh, in addition to doing a test, um, you know, maybe filling out those questionnaires that come along with it to give us great data to maybe find some useful insight. Right now, we're, we're not raising money, but I, I hope that, uh, you know, we can get the community involved and provide a valuable service while we do. Ryan Smith, founder of True Diagnostic. It was a pleasure. Thank Thanks. you very much. Yeah, very, very great interview. Thanks for having me.